dragons. Hello everyone, it's Biddy Cup Gamer, and today I'm excited to be going alongside you guys as we discuss Spyro's first step into the mysterious realm of sequels, which has been a rather precarious place for the little guy. When a new IP reaches a massive enough success, it's only natural to want to evolve upon your original concept. In fact, before the dark arts of DLC and virtual currencies were viable solutions, sequels were obviously the go-to choice. So given the reputation of the era surrounding Spyro the Dragon's debut, it's a little surprise that a sequel is soon developed for the budding series. But what came out of it was certainly a surprise. Originally released in 99 for the PlayStation, Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage was a major jump ahead of its predecessor, with its legacy shaping the course of much of the early franchise. It's here where we're first introduced to many of the series' most iconic characters, as well as several new concepts we see incorporated in future titles. But despite being a complete Spyro freak as a kid, I never wound up experiencing this game in its heyday. So due to my minimal experience with the original, this review will be solely based on the reignited iteration's own merits, independent of its PlayStation variant. With that said, let's see how Spyro embarks on a second grand adventure. Opening at a water-drenched stone hill, Spyro along with his buddy Sparks are sick of all the incessant rainfall. So after catching sight of the radiant glow emanating from Dragon Shores, they decide that a vacation is just what they need. And from here on, the game ceases to be normal. In an unexpected twist, Spyro and Sparks arrive in a mysterious realm called Avalon. Here we're greeted by Alora, Hunter, the Professor, and Zoe, the ones seemingly responsible for this bizarre turn of events. But before they could even explain their intentions for practically abducting Spyro, the raucous little runt Ripto and his goons show up to wreak havoc. Were you trying to keep something from me? A dragon? You brought a dragon to Avalar? I hate dragons! Yeah! I wonder if he's the villain. After losing his scepter, Ripto and his two cronies, Crush and Gulp, decide to retreat for the time being. That being the case, this should give our new friends plenty of time to fill our purple palin. I haven't got time to explain. Here, take this magic guide to Avalar. It'll help you begin to understand our worlds. Right now, I have to follow Ripto and see what he's up to. I'll meet you in Summer Forest, okay? Hey, wait a minute! Nah, I guess not. In many ways, Ripto's Rage accomplishes precisely what any competent sequel should. From the moment you set foot in Glimmer, you can immediately tell that the original developers wanted to do much more than to simply dish out another Spyro the Dragon. Still, at its core, Ripto's Rage is very much its natural successor. From the fundamental control scheme, gameplay patterns, and overall structure, Ripto's Rage retains all the key features of its predecessor, which if you've watched part 1 of my review, you'll already know that that's an automatic win for me. That said, since I've already spent time discussing those elements within the prior video, I'll primarily be focusing on the various changes made within Ripto's Rage, which is a lot. While exploring Avalar's many worlds, you'll immediately notice a major shift from the first title's level design. To bypass Ripto's magical barriers, Spyro is tasked with collecting each world perspective talisman. But to do this, he must first prove his worth to that land's inhabitants by solving whatever predicament facing them. On the surface, this may seem like a trivial alteration. However, when you compare these levels to Spire of the Dragons, the repercussions of this change are quite significant. Unlike the former, which primarily structured its levels around its collectibles, Ripto's Rages are heavily designed around meeting the unique objectives corresponding to each world. This tosses Spyro into a variety of zany scenarios, such as having to save distraught workers from rampaging tikis, or rescuing the Ice Builder Shaman from the vile Ice Wizards. Whereas the prior game's scenario for the majority of time was just booting nasty squatters, Every world here poses its own problem, as well as a distinct way of solving it, resulting in each one feeling drastically different from the next. Sure, the essential philosophy of scouring every nook and cranny for shiny things is ever present, but Ripta's Rage's approach pushes that basic premise in a far more interesting direction. The most noteworthy example of this would be in how it handles its secondary collectibles, the orbs. No matter which level you're playing, there's at least one of these green globes for Spire to scoop up. Barring a few hidden ones sprinkled about the homeworlds, orbs are generally rewarded by different NPCs for completing side quests, like playing hockey in Colossus, or recovering bones so a caveman can put his buddy back together. Which is weird. While there's certainly some duds in the mix like this utter time waster here, most have aged considerably well, with some comprising my fondest memories with the game. I'd say they're worthy additions, as they add some nice diversity to the standard gameplay and heavily contribute to the personality of each level. Like the talisman and orbs, we also see some minor features implemented to enhance the player's experience. 
As opposed to the brief snippets of dialogue with the elders, there's actual NPCs to talk to now, and the new designated areas for side quests result in the level designs feeling far more fleshed out than before. But the most peculiar addition by far are the power-up gates. Serving as a replacement for supercharged pads and berry smooches, Spyro can now use these gates to activate those same abilities, as well as new ones like Vertigo. And the only requirement for accessing these magical marvels is to kill things. Rather than dropping gems upon defeat, the enemies in Rift's Rage release spirit particles, which serve as a sort of energy source for the power-up gates. So once you've finished your little murderous rampage, Spyro can then access these various boons to fulfill side quests or explore otherwise inaccessible areas of the map. Which is all fine and dandy, but who made these things, and why? Yet true to its predecessor, these collectibles and the many trials underwent in acquiring them all lead to the inevitable roadblocks. And boy does this game love them. Up front, they're not terrible. It's just the sheer number of them that always surprises me. The talismans are very reasonable, as it basically just requires you to play the actual levels before confronting the boss. And the orb roadblocks, while occasionally barring your path, are usually not a problem given how generous they are. But for the gems, we're given the king of all roadblocks. So Ripto's Rage marks the first appearance of Moneybags, the infamous tycoon who attempts to sponge fire dry of his gems at every turn. Oftentimes he does so by simply barring bridges and portals, opening them once you've paid the infamous small fee. This would be incredibly annoying if gems weren't so easy to come by, but goodness he does this a lot. However, there are certain instances where Teddy Tightwad deserves a share of the loot. There's three points in the game where Moneybags teaches Spyro new movesets. That is, once he's cleaned you out, of course. The first is swimming, and I absolutely love this one. Underwater controls can be a bit finicky in video games, but these feel just as nice as Spyro's default controls. I always look forward any time one of the levels implements an underwater segment, which is the exact opposite for me most of the time. Later on, we also learn how to climb, which is a rather enjoyable, albeit strange gimmick. With the exception of where you learn it in Autumn Plains and in Magma Cone, climbing is unfortunately never really utilized all that well, oftentimes serving as a means to reach taller platforms, which whirlwinds already do, or better yet, prevent you from accessing certain orbs in the early game. I have to say this is one of Ripto's Rage's more notable downsides. Spacing out your new abilities like this does help keep the experience from growing stale, but it often tends to allow earlier abilities to outshine others. Then there's also that incentive for making the player backtrack, because there's nothing more enjoyable than returning to a spot only to discover that the quest at the top had absolutely nothing to do with the ability you just learned. Why couldn't have this just been accessible the first time I was here? Now, this only occurs a few times, and this is only a minor inconvenience. But when half my memories of a simple fun move like Head Bash are from having to return to some of the more tedious worlds to form an underwhelming side quest, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't somewhat disappointed. So as a sequel, I think Ripto's Rage does many things right. There are certainly some bizarre additions here and there that either can feel a bit shoehorned in or could have been integrated better, but these more or less still complement the gameplay. It's apparent the original developers didn't want their sequel to solely provide a comparable experience to Spire of the Dragon, but one that expanded upon nearly every concept that made its predecessor shine. And they achieved that. However, I don't believe any of the enhancements I've mentioned thus far are its greatest achievement. For me, that handedly goes to its world building. Now I won't pretend that the story of Ripto's Rage is a masterpiece, because it's not. Unless preventing an angry little munchkin from taking over the world due to a bunch of uncanny coincidences that happen to coincide is your sort of thing. I still like it. There's just so much personality to this game. Perhaps too much. Yet compared to what Spyro came from, this was definitely a step in the right direction. The dragons in Spyro the Dragon, while personable and provided far more depth in the remake, were essentially just sentient player guides as opposed to full-fledged characters. But in Ripto's Rage, we get both. And while I find Nasty Nork's potential motivations to be the more interesting, especially with the third game in mind, it's pretty obvious why Ripto became the more recurring villain. He's just such a fun antagonist, and the interactions between Spyro and him flow incredibly well. Bring it on, shorty! Go! Come here now! This character focus also makes for some interesting boss fights. Unlike Spire of the Dragon's bosses, Crush and Gulp are provided actual roles within the story. And while very much your typical dim-witted psychics, we see from the very beginning that, like Ripto, they're a force to be reckoned with. And their battles actually relay that message. Contrary to bosses from the past title, these actually fulfill what you'd expect from a boss. 
Each one provides a relatively decent challenge, as well as multiple phases and movesets to keep the player on his toes. From modern standards, I wouldn't say these are by any means exceptional, but they're miles ahead of Spire of the Dragon. Even with the total number of bosses being dropped by half, I didn't find it to be an issue, given how much the original developers had improved upon them in between games. I'd say the only downside to this revamp design was in how it replaced the boss's signature level with the arena structure, as the former provided a nice build-up to the actual encounter. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with the arenas, I just think they're a tad bland in comparison. However, this is the only area of the game that's remotely bland. The various worlds Spyro explores all have distinct visuals, music, enemies, and scenarios providing a diverse experience no matter where you go. Whereas Spyro the Dragon also had a very similar approach to its level design, those worlds oftentimes maintain certain consistent themes reflective of their homeworld. But with Ripto's Rage, each one is completely unique. The speedways are a perfect example of how prioritizing variety can help even the most basic of areas stick out. None of these look or play like the next, whereas in Spire of the Dragon, the distinctions between one flight world to the next are certainly not as stark. But the sole aspect that always impresses me whenever I return to Ripto's Rage are those intro and outro clips. Nearly every level has these brief cutscenes that introduces the player to whatever predicament the inhabitants are currently up against, as well as ones that serve as a sort of epilogue for when you accomplish the primary objective. These serve as nothing more than to help immerse you in the realm of Avalar, which is something I'd really love to see return in a future Spyro game. This is also what showcases most of this game's great humor, as well as the type that makes me question the devs' mental states. I mean, I enjoy dark humor, but wow, there's an awful lot of it. So the word I used when summarizing Spyro the Dragon was simple, and I think that applied well to virtually every one of its characteristics. That's not the case with Ripto's Rage. Save the soundtrack and integral gameplay, you can tell that the Insomniac developers wanted their sequel to stand out from the first title. This resulted in larger worlds, an expanded moveset, new power-ups, side quests, longer character interactions, etc., all being pressed into the original's mold, and to varying success. That said, the weaker traits within Victor's Rage are oftentimes a result of a misplaced opportunity than anything else. I believe Ripto's Rage is the pinnacle of the franchise. It maintained everything I loved about Spire of the Dragon and added countless new worthwhile features. The worlds themselves are oozing with creativity, the new movesets are a nice touch, and the many wacky characters are always pleasant to talk to. I think Ambitious best describes this game. And for the most part, Insomniac's efforts paid off. And that concludes part 2 of the Reunited Trilogy review. It's interesting how different it felt writing for this video compared to the last one. I suppose nostalgia really is a powerful thing. If you guys enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate your support as well as your feedback. Also, let me know your own thoughts on Ripto's Rage in the comments. I'll be uploading part 3 in the near future, where I'll be discussing Year of the Dragon. Oh boy. So hopefully I'll be seeing you all there as well. As always, God bless and happy gaming.